All right, let's continue with uh, more rules. All right, so the rules we have so far is, which lead to the, the fallacies based upon them. Okay, so we have, you're supposed to affirm the hypothesis. You're supposed to deny the conclusion. Those are valid reasoning. Um, other ones that I think pretty much, when most people look at these, <laughs> you'd look at them and say, well, don't these make sense? And the answer would be, yes, they, they really should. Because these are things that we actually use in discussion, right? These are, you would actually speak in this way without necessarily knowing that, hey, look, this is a provably a tautology. I mean, it would be kind of silly if we are modeling a form of discussion in truths and it didn't match what we actually do. <laughs> and it, it actually does match what we do. And it's, it's kind of nice to have something that starts simple and it's built up into things that we actually do. So one would be something that we're used to. Um, let's use some other side symbols. So let's say we have a square implies a, a triangle and a triangle implies a circle. Hence, the square must imply the circle, right? And so this would be hypothetical syllogism. Now, most people will look at this and say, well, that kind of looks transitive. Yeah, transitivity comes from this idea, but the strict name for it is hypothetical syllogism. So if my name is Mark, then I teach this class. If I teach this class, then I'm happy. Therefore, if my name is Mark, then I'm happy is a valid conclusion, given that if those two premises are true. Uh, we would have disjunctive syllogism. I have a square or I have a triangle. By the way, I don't have a square. Well, that would mean, obviously, that you have a triangle. So that'd be disjunctive syllogism. Makes sense, right? And especially when you use them for like really simple things like this. It's if I have a square, I have a square or a triangle in my hand. By the way, I don't have a square. OK, you have a triangle. You can take this and form. Yes, that's a tautology. Um, if you want to at put things together, so let's go back to P. So let's say we have P, and now I want to throw something to it in a valid way. So if you have P, then you have P, or you have Q. So we could think of it this way. The person walks in, I have an apple. Well, yes, you do, and I can think of a valid conclusion. You have an apple, or you have an orange. And it's like, well, why? Well, it's not going to change the truth values. If you tell me you have something, you're going to have that or something else, right? Normally what we would add would somehow, you know, make sense to put this in it, but the only way that you can add an extra proposition is with an or. And so it's called addition. But the understanding is if you want to combine something new, right, that you don't know whether or not for certain, you have to put it with an or. Uh, so a typical technique when people get this wrong in a fallacy is they use an operator other than or. And if you don't use an or, you get a fallacy. Okay, what if I would want to go the other way? What if I would want to throw things away? Well, you could throw things away. So let's say I have an apple and I have an orange. Then what valid conclusion can you have? Well, you could throw one of these away. It doesn't really matter. I could throw away the orange. I could throw away the apple. It doesn't matter, but I have one, right? If you have two things. You have an apple and you have an orange. Well, I'm not interested in the orange. So I'm only going to say, therefore, you have an apple. I'm going to focus on just one of them. So throw away the one that's not interesting. That's subtraction. So when can we subtract? If I have an and statement, I can take away one of them and just keep the one that interests me. On the other hand, if I only have one thing, if I want to put a new one with it, I have to put it under with or. And so that would be addition. This would be Subtraction, it's also called simplification. Um, another one would be to resolve something. You have P or you have Q. By the way, you actually don't have P or you have R. And then you look at this and say, well, obviously, I'm going to have Q or R. And this is called resolution. Each of these that I've done, whether it's affirming the hypothesis, denying the conclusion, any of these things that I've done, are all provably a tautology. And when you go through these, 
and you have human discussions, it's pretty straightforward that, yeah, we, we use these <laughs> in actual debate. We, we use these in discussions, and it makes sense that they should be tautologies, and they do. Uh, it's more interesting sometimes when you get to ones that are more complicated and they don't necessarily get their own name, but you can get a valid step-by-step -step premise, premise, premise with a valid conclusion of an argument form. Now there's two more argument forms uh, each for quantification that I want to cover. And what we do under this quantification with the rules of inference is what these do is they move from specific examples into some sort of general statement and they'll move from general statements back to specific examples. So if I have specific examples that have been given to me and I move to a general statement, this particular con technique is called generalization. And to go the other way is instantiation. So what do these look like? Um, let's take universal. So if somebody tells me that, you know what, it's true that for everybody in my class, they are a person. Well, if it's true for everybody in my class that they're a person, I could definitely pick a person in nature and say that, hey, for persons... For this C and for any C in the classroom, they have that predicate. So an example of this, this is called universal instantiation. So if I say all men are not islands, then I could say Mark is not an island if I want to talk about Mark. Because it allows me to say that if you tell me that all, I could pick anybody I want and now strictly talk about them. On the other hand, it's a little more complicated if I would say there exists somebody that has this feature. Like someone in the room has this property. So someone in their classroom is a person, and then there I'd have to actually find, that's the problem here for this one, for existential instantiation. I'm going to have to actually find the person. So it's the difference between this. If I have a room full of people and somebody tells me that everybody in this room is a person, then I can pick anybody I want and I immediately know John is a person, Jane is a person, whoever. But on the other hand, if they come in the room and they say someone in this room is a person, well, then I've got to find them. But it's true for somebody, but i got to find their name. So if I have a room full of people and I say all the people are teachers, it doesn't matter who I pick. That person's Person one's a teacher, person two's a teacher. That's universal instantiation. And so I can pick anybody I want. But if I say someone in this room is a teacher, I've literally got to find them. Who is it? Well, it's Mark. Okay, Mark is the teacher. I found them. And so you have to find the specific instance under existential. On the other hand, we could go the other way. Let's say somebody came up with a list and said that um, they found out that everybody in the room uh, uh, likes drinking coffee. So they went around and they had their entire list and they said, okay, Mark likes coffee, John likes coffee, Jane likes coffee, and they found out that everybody in the room said yes to liking coffee. Well, what I could do is I could throw away their entire list and just simply say, everyone likes coffee. Whoops. <laughs> I can bind it to everyone. So I can, I don't know who, the specific names don't matter to me anymore. I just simply say everyone. And this is called universal generalization. On the other hand, if somebody came up with a list and said, this specific person likes coffee then what I can do is go ahead and throw away their list and j then just simply say someone in this room likes coffee. I don't have to name them, right? I've lost the instance of who they are and I just said, look, I don't care what their name is, I'm just going to say someone likes coffee in this room. And that is existential. Just 
generalization. So all of these things are tautologies and all of these things are stuff we can use as we go through an argument process, which is to take premises, restate them to form a conclusion, work it with another premise, get another conclusion. As long as we stay within, within using truths, we form valid conclusions, and that's a process that we go through. All right. Next, I'll be talking, I'll give a couple of examples.